guys? Welcome back to another episode of Creative Corner. Um, starting to get a lot of great interviews, um, and this series is really going, so I'm pretty excited. I hope you enjoyed the last episode with Wes uh, Weitzenhofer. Um, we talked a lot about movies and inspiration and being a filmmaker and all that, so I hope you guys like that. Uh, for this episode, I am with my longtime friend, okay. Sandra. Okay. And uh, we've known what well, we've gone back since what was it senior year of high school? Yeah, at what least that. that. At least that. Yeah, sure. So that's what 12, 13 years. Yes. She's blossomed into a <laughs> <laughs> quite the poet since then. We some of us knew there was something special there even back then. Oh uh, wow! Well. But but I think um, so. We are here to talk about your poetry. Yeah. And, uh, all of that. You looks like your most recent chapbook, Confluence, is doing quite well. Yeah, Confluence is doing great. It's actually here's the here's the book. I don't know if that really showed up the first time, but um, this is actually my first full length collection, meaning it's slightly thick. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still pretty. It's still pretty thin, um, but. Um, I yeah, I have had a couple chapbooks come out before this, and so this is the first book that kind of encapsulates everything that I have been doing in the past five years or so. Um, and we've done pretty well. We've sold a few hundred copies, awesome. and um, I was on a book tour this summer. I went all around the U.S. I'm I'm sure Jared has is sick of seeing all of my posts about going everywhere, <laughs> but it was really fun. And now that we're back in the swing of things for the fall. I'm back teaching, which means I get to do fun things like this and, and talk to you about the book online. So, but yes, it's been going really well. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear about the success. Yeah. The book, but I guess we'll go ahead and dive right in. And um, when did you start writing? How long has it been for you? I know some it starts really early, some it doesn't mm -hmm. start so early, but... Yeah. How long you yeah. Writing for? Okay. Well, I would say I remember. I think in the fourth or fifth grade, I won. I didn't win. I should. I take that back. I didn't win, but I think I. I won second place, okay. and I, like yes, in <laughs> in a school district competition for Crime Stoppers, we had to write a story about. Um, Something that had to do with crime, I think, in the neighborhood or neighborhood watch. And I wrote this story, and I remember my mother helping me to bind it with this really ugly orange yarn that she had sitting around from crochet projects she never finished. And me write, writing the story and then, like, making all these illustrations. So that's the first thing I remember actually putting a lot of effort into. As a kid, I had a lot of imaginary friends and I made up a lot of stories and things like that and I remember writing some of them down but um, that was kind of the first thing that I remember doing and putting a lot of effort into but I didn't start writing poetry until high school probably probably say I was like 15 or 16 years old when I started writing any sort of poetry and um, which was around the same time that I started listening to my own types of music. I started discovering music. I was kind of a latecomer to that. So um, at that same time, I started to write poetry based on some of the lyrics in, in the first bands that I really liked. Like, um, this is embarrassing to admit, admit now, but I remember when I was in high school, I used to love to write um, poetry while I was listening to like, you know, Dashboard Confessional or things like that. So so I remember that. And, and then I didn't really start publishing poems until like late in college. You know, I started kind of getting in the swing of doing that at that time. But I have always been a writer. In fact, it's kind of funny. I had I talked to somebody that I knew way back when in high school, which who we both knew, I think. And I was asking this person, um, did you think that I'd be doing this now? Um, because I had different ideas at the time about career and stuff. And she was like, oh, yeah, we always thought you would be writing. And I said... <laughs> Really? <laughs> so I guess that's good, right? I, I found the thing that I really wanted to do. So, What were your earliest inspirations? I think, um, I, even in, in the last interview, I was like, I know I ask this every single time, but I think it's 
it's key to understanding where a creative person comes from regardless of the the means of creativity it's true i think i think this is endlessly fascinating actually too i love to to hear whose people's inspirations are so um probably the first poet i started reading really seriously sorry i've got a software update coming <laughs> um that's annoying so but uh, the first poet that I started reading really seriously was Sharon Olds, um, who you may or may not know Sharon Olds. She's she's one of those poets who sort of um, some mainstream people know. She's kind of a biggie as far as contemporary poets, along with, you know, people like Billy Collins or Mary Oliver. You know, she's kind of along that, that level. One of my um, old roommates was her TA, I believe, or she was his academic advisor at NYU. <laughs> yes. So, she's yeah, been I know Sharon much. Olds. She's been around for forever. One thing I'll tell you about Sharon Olds is I don't write anything like Sharon Olds now. But Sharon Olds, when I was in college, really kind of taught me that you could you could make poetry your own, which seems ridiculous. That seems obvious now. Um, but at the time, you know, I had read, who had I read, like Edgar Allan Poe or The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which I enjoyed those things, but I didn't find a touchstone within them for myself. But when I read Sharon Olds, I said, okay, you know, this woman is doing this now. She's alive. You know, she's writing about her experiences as a woman, woman in the world. Um, she's writing about a lot of taboo subjects. She gave me the power, and she was endlessly fascinating. So it was easy to, like, gobble up her books, you know. Um, one funny thing about inspirations is probably now one of my biggest inspirations is Elizabeth Bishop. And I also really like Emily Dickinson. But when I was in college, as an undergrad, I hated them. I thought they were way too dense. I thought that they were way too scholarly. And I just hated – I just couldn't penetrate their poems. But now I really love them. So – it's interesting how those things come back around. Both, both of us as writers, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to partition our writing off from our life. Yes. It is, they aren't separate. Mm -hmm. um, each inform each other. So how has inspirations or poets like Sharon Olds mm -hmm. infiltrated your life and influenced your life? I know Wendell Berry mm -hmm. has had huge influence on my life and my view of environmentalism or right um, pablo neruda in right. my view of love right and all that so yeah. yeah yeah well i think what sharon olds gave me was the freedom you know to just kind of say whatever do, you know one of her poems says do what you're going to do and i will tell about it so you know that's sort of like your get out of jail free card that you can you can write anything um so maybe there's that I will say the poets that I love now, um, Bishop has taught me a lot about order and organization. Um, a lot of times we're told as poets that you're flighty or you're a creative person and you're, you know, you don't have to be or you're not expected to be someone who appreciates an organized, quiet life. Um, but in a lot of ways, what Bishop has shown me is um, spirituality through nature and um, beautiful, which also Mary Oliver obviously is a big influence there too. Um, and, but then I think the idea Bishop does these wonderful things with metrics and she always makes it, makes it new in that way. So I love her for that. Lee Young Lee is also a, a, an influence of mine. And I think it has a lot to do with his ideas of spirituality and he's sort of a surrealist. Um, and the idea of combining the magical and the religious um, or the spiritual. And that's something we don't do in the West very much. But people like Neruda or Octavio Paz, mm -hmm. who are big influences of mine too, that idea of heightened reality and that heightened reality or it, it being... Um, bringing us close to God or the God force in some way. So, so those are all things that, um, to me, when I write, I feel like I am communing, you know, I feel like it is a, a sanctuary for me. It's a sacred space. So, you know, you're right. I mean, the practice of writing is something that is, 
that does inform my value system, my beliefs, you know, it's a way to commune. So, yeah. I, I like that you bring up the idea of that as creative and creative people and writers, we are, are seen as someone that is this flighty that, oh, we just have this, we just wait for the, the creativity to come to us or, right. Right. or, or the muse and then we just write and we just <laughs> dance around in, in prairies <laughs> and, and all that. But there is a, a, a very ugly and very, <laughs> I don't know, this pleasurable or painful process mm -hmm. to writing. Some would call that craft or revision, or we could call that painful and ugly, and I think either one really works. <laughs> it's just, but it, it, it's just the, the, I don't know if I want to call it a cognitive dissonance or yeah. maybe the, the dilemma of writing is that it, it's finding a balance because if I just wait until the whimsy and the creativity comes to me or I force myself to write, it's not always the best product, but it's, yeah. it's, it, it, it's hard to explain. I'm trying, trying, you know, to figure out a way to explain it, but. No, I think, I think what you're saying is there's two parts to the equation, at least two parts. Like you can, in a way I do kind of subscribe to some notions of inspiration for a first draft, yeah. especially poems, because a first draft of a poem can come pretty quickly. Um, it's not like a novel in that way. Of course, to write a book of them, you have to like really sit down and dedicate yourself yeah. to those subjects. But to write one singular poem, you can kind of rely on some forms of inspiration. But then, like the process of me writing a poem after the first draft is dozens of revisions working through a lot of things that are not so attractive, like you're mentioning, a lot of it has to do with actually, I keep ta talking about it this way and people don't like it, but it's like working a math problem for me in the funnest way. And I really dislike math, but poetry has like given me my math mojo back. So just when I look at my poems, I, I think about how can I give them symmetry and structure? So I look at words that are repeated and I scan everything. I, you know, most of my poems are metrical. I look for places where I can replace something or go against the grid. And I do different things with forms. So to, to build all that in, none of that is there in the first draft. But you have to go back through in the revision and first of all, get it right. Whatever you want to say and whatever complexities you want there to be, there's all that for the meaning. And then there's the music and getting the music and the form correct. So it's really, it, it's a dual hemisphere, you know, brain exercise. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes what happens, I think, is people who want to write, but they want to write, they want to use their creative side of their brain, but then what they don't want to do is polish or perfect what they've written. And that's okay, actually. I don't think we need everybody to be a publishing practicing professional writer. Um, I think we need people who are just hobbyists, you know, but if you want to be, if you want to publish and you want to practice and you want to grow, you need to put those two things together. And it's really, it's actually really difficult because a lot of us don't have both of those things in the same measure, which means you have to really work <laughs> on the one side, maybe more so than you have to do on the other side to compensate and things. And, it's difficult. Speaking of publishing, I'd like you to, I guess, to get your insight on this. But sure. there have been times in the past where I have been told that, and I think you've you've seen me speak about this on Facebook, that unless you have been published, you are not a writer. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I, I really don't. I mean, I've heard really ridiculous things before from people saying, you know, don't call yourself, specifically in poetry, I don't know why, but don't call yourself a poet. Someone else needs to call you a poet before you can call yourself a poet. I don't know what kind of sense that makes. I think there's a, a big culture. There's kind, there seems to be a couple of sides to this, but at least among the writers I know, there's a, a culture of 
I don't want to say self-deprecation or shame, but just people who maybe are not willing to sort of own it. Um, but for me, I feel like you kind of have to, you have to walk the walk and you have to just say, yeah, I'm doing this and it's messy and it's hard, but this is a huge part of my identity. And so you can't really disown it. You know, you can't say you're not a writer, um, just because you haven't published something. I, I don't think that makes any sense. Easier said than done. I think some people are really, really uncomfortable claiming a title like that, unless they feel like they have some credential to go behind it. But I was calling myself a writer at an early age. And so I think that if you want to do it, if that's going to help you to kind of feel justified in continuing down the path, then you, you got to do what you got to do. And I think it's fine. Um, if someone's telling you that, they may feel like it's etiquette or it's a specific custom. But we all know that we're living in this age where we have to hustle. You know, people are taking different paths to things than they used to. Um, a lot of those old rules don't apply. So... I would say go for it. In, in light of, of that, um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. The idea of self-publishing and, and yeah. what it does, I don't want to say it dilutes <laughs> the water or right. it dilutes right. everything because that, that's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is, is that it provides an opportunity for those right. that are – absolutely talented writers mm -hmm. that for some reason aren't being recognized by magazines or publishing companies and I just I wonder you're yeah you are one that helps people with editing their manuscripts and I and I wonder your your stance or your opinion on self-publishing and, and all that I think for some people it can be really useful um I had a client who was in her 70s um, she's actually was a really great writer. I really enjoyed her work. And she was like, look, I don't have, she was in good health and she's still alive and, and doing fine. This was just a couple of years ago. But she said, you know, I don't have all that much time left. I have these books I've been saving up for years. I've been working on them for years. Um, I want to push them out there and I want them to get into people's hands. And she hired me and she had me go through them and I gave her ideas and she re reworked things. And these are books that I think she probably could have gotten published given uh, the amount of time that she would have had to put in. She could have gotten them published traditionally, but it would have been a long road. I mean, for me trying to get books published traditionally, it's taken between, depending on the book, a year and five years. Yeah. So when you're 77, 71 years old, right? You'd be like 76 or 77 by the time the book is coming out. And so I told her, I think you should go for it, you know, and the books look beautiful. She did it the right way. She hired an editor. She had somebody look through it. So I honestly think self-publishing can be great. It also depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so my pastor, <laughs> actually, um, he wrote a book that he felt like he really wanted people to have specifically people in his congregation and he you know he felt the need to publish it obviously he has a full-time job yeah. he didn't really want to pursue agents and things like this so he self-published it and the book looks pretty good you know it's serving his it's his purpose he's done readings from it I think it really depends on the category and what you're looking to get out of it meaning like the genre of the book and where you, like for me for my job um it, it was important for me, not just for my job, but for myself to traditionally publish. But I went with an indie publisher to try to get poetry published through like Knopf or Random House or something would be a commitment um, that I'm not really willing to pursue and also probably an exercise in futility. <laughs> so I went with an indie publisher, um, which is kind of the happy go-between. I mean, I didn't pay anything for this book to be published. It was traditionally published in that way. They wanted to support me. But on the other hand, that big publicity machine and all those big responsibilities you have going with a traditional publisher, yeah. a lot of those things aren't available to you. So we make compromises. So how has the, the book tour been? How has that experience been for you? Well, 
Um, it was a, it was really amazing and exhausting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'll do it again, at least not for a while. I'll probably do it again. This was a major release confluence for me. Yeah. Um, and so if I ha when I have a book like that again, that's a full length collection, it probably won't be for three or four years. I may have the energy to do this again. Um, but I went to <laughs> I went to Kentucky, I went to Tennessee, Pittsburgh. Um, all over Ohio. I'm going to Kansas City still next month to finish up a up a date. I'm going to Virginia, DC area. So it it's been it's been tiring. The trick is also um, to kind of work the money out and the stays out. So it's kind of fun to stay at some friends' houses, people that I've only met over the internet, but um, have reading series or you know can set up a reading at a bookstore or a coffee shop for me. That the generosity has been amazing. Actually, um, I'm not worthy of how well people have treated me. Yes, you are. Yeah, well, thank you. But, I mean, you know, they've been very kind. People have been very kind. So, and, um, yeah, so what I kind of did, and this might be helpful for somebody else who's planning something like this, if you're sort of a minor leaguer like me, um, what you try to do is get about five or six, at least what I did was try to get about five or six readings where they pay you to come on out and read because they're few and far between. And then I had about... I would say 20 events where I was just going basically gratis and trying to sell some books. But those five or six paid events, I budgeted pretty carefully and I tried to see if I could get the money from those to sort of cover most of the expenses for the free events. And then I sold some books and it made it pretty affordable because I was staying with people at their houses and stuff like that and like the generosity I mentioned before. So if you were going to go on a book tour, I would say really establish your network before you go. Try to, you know, work that network that you have with friends and people in your industry. Um, and it can be a really pleasurable, fun experience. Uh, also hydrate and get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious, as, as we discussed just a few minutes ago, that yeah. you do have clients in which you edit scripts and all that. How has that influenced your writing? Oh my God, it's been amazing, actually. Um, I had that, that client that I talked about before, the 71-year-old woman. <laughs> uh, she was my first client. And I didn't, I hadn't, I had published a couple of shorter books, chat books, mm -hmm. and she, she kind of um, approached me and she said, you know, I have a manuscript I'd love for you to look over. I really appreciate your work. Um, and so I started looking at it for her and then Confluence came out and I was like, you know, I could do this. I could do this as sort of like a freelance gig. Um, and I started reading them and this summer I read about 10 or 12 books. So every couple of weeks I had a new one in my lap. Really actually every week I probably was looking at a new book. Um, and it was really influential for me because part of the key in getting a poetry book book published today, a, a single author collection, is that you need to have like a theme or a, star, a story arc sort of running through it. And that's one of the hardest things for poets to do, including me. It's very difficult because as poets, we're sort of wired differently. We don't really think about plot. Um, sometimes the way we think about characters is very different. So to think about arc in the book, even if it's sort of loose, it's still difficult. We're not novelists. So, um, but you can't just publish like Yeats published or Auden where you just publish some poems that go together kind of, you know. So reading all these books really helped me to figure out different ways to put together a collection in a, in a either, you know, to tell a story or if not to tell a story, variations on a theme or to kind of discuss different formal elements or have, you know, kind of recurrences throughout the book. So that was actually a great learning experience for me. I really enjoyed it. I love looking at people's books. It's kind of a cool little spyglass into what does somebody else's work in progress look like, especially when they've taken it as far as they think they can take it without having an editor look at it. Um, but this is something that I found that's really needed because a lot of people think they're going to get this in grad school and or from a friend or from another poet and they don't because it's actually a lot of work 
<laughs> so um, what I found is people are very grateful for the service, but it's something that makes me really happy. I probably do it for cheaper than I should because I just really like doing it. Um, and so it's been it's been fun, and I feel like when I'm ready to put together a book again, I'll have that info. It's harder to put into practice than it is to you know, look at somebody else's book and say, ah, I see what they're doing. Um, it's harder to do it yourself still, but I think that it will be really useful for me. Um, the two books that I'm working on, one has a very strong narrative thread. The other really doesn't. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how that comes together when I, when I have enough poems to make books out of them. So. I have to say, one of the the favorite things I, I love about your writing and especially when you share it on Facebook and this is a, um, a unifying theme that brings us together but how much baseball and yes. Wrigley Field <laughs> informs your writing um, and I don't want to wax too you know existential about baseball but there's something about, especially Wrigley Field, but a yes. baseball in general that, mm -hmm. I don't know, that stirs something in the soul. And I don't know yeah. if you feel the same way. I do feel the same way. I, I actually have a friend, Amy Freeman, I'm going to give her a shout out, but she wrote a paper in grad school about um, baseball, going to the ballpark as um, a religious service. And if you think about it, there's a lot of similarities there. You're getting together with a large group of people to experience something bigger than yourself. You're singing two songs, maybe three. Um, you're, um, right. You're, you're, um, you're watching something happen and your all your attention is on it. You know, there's a lot of commonalities with this and, with sports and religion and, and we always make jokes about you know football is religion or baseball is religion but so for me I totally agree with you there's a lot there's a lot there that's it's very philosophically wrapped up um, one of my favorite writers Annie Dillard writes a lot about baseball um, it seems to just sort of weave in you know she'll be writing a book and talking about how she's writing this book and she'll be watching people play softball outside and you know or she'll talk she was actually also a really great softball player and you just you can kind of see like that this is this is another it's an it's an easy metaphor you know and for me it plays a lot on spirituality with the rule of threes there's so many threes in baseball and um so <sighs> Yes, so right now, as you know, I'm writing this book of poems about the Cubs and Wrigley. Yay. Yay! And I am, and I hadn't really written about this previously, although in eighth grade, I wrote a poem, actually. This was maybe the first serious poem that I wrote, was a poem about the 1998 Cubs wild card game. Um, and then the series against the Braves. I went to a game in that series where Kerry Wood started it against Greg Maddox, I think. Um, and it was, it was, I think, the first game in that series. That would make sense for the pitching matchup. So I wrote this really long poem about it. And then the poem got lost because I didn't have a computer. Um, and the poem got lost. It was on a piece of paper. And so kind of this book has been brewing in me since then. Um, I wanted to write Confluence. I, those were the poems that, you know, I worked on all through grad school and they were important to me. But as soon as that book was published, I said, I need to write this book about the Cubs because I wanted to write it forever. So I'm now writing it. And um, I think I have about 20 poems out of probably the 50 or so that I will write. Um, but a lot of them also have to do with the radio and listening to ball games on the radio, which is sort of curious, but I've realized also that that's part of my love affair with baseball is listening to someone describe um, it happening. And I noticed that over the years, a lot of the times, especially when I was living in Virginia for four years, I got the radio package for um, MLB because the TV was too expensive. I was a grad student. The radio package was $20 a year to anybody who needs to listen to more baseball games on internet radio. It's super cheap. 
Um, and I just remember really that was my lifeline, you know, so I ended up writing a lot of poems about listening to baseball on the radio and, and about the stadium. And so I'll read a few later and you can kind of give me your commentary. Since you are now a full-time professor and I will give you an opportunity to be profes professorial, professorial <laughs> to any viewer that is a writer that mm -hmm. wants to pursue a deeper engagement with their writing sure. or anything. Um, how would you recommend, I know each person's process is different and yeah. not one process is identical, but there is still procedural stuff that mm -hmm. is good for producing the best writing possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, any recommendations to anyone that are fi finding it hard to just sit down and write? Yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this book. Um, Anne Lamont's Bird by Bird um, is an amazing book on craft. And it is, she's mostly a prose writer, but I know many poets that love this book. So I think it's pretty universal. Um, and she talks about shitty first drafts. Yeah, and so had to read right. that article in our first year of seminary. Right. That's good that they're showing you that in seminary. That gives me hope. So, <laughs> but yeah, so um, the first thing I would say is to write write something down. And I'm not going to tell you to write every day because I don't do that. Um, but I think if you, if, if, if you have an inkling or an idea, don't shut it out. Whatever you can write down, whether it's on a cocktail napkin or in your phone notes or whatever, write it down. That's how I go about things these days is I'll stop, I'll pull the car over and stop and just write down whatever I've got, you know, and I may not look at it again for a couple of weeks, but at least I've written it down and that makes it easier yeah. to go back, I think. Um, even if you, all you have is a bullet point, it, point list. Um, so I would say stop and write it down if you have anything. But really what I find is for a lot of people, they can kind of get started, but the issue with taking your writing to the next level is getting past that first draft, right? A lot of times people will just go over and over and just be like, I don't know if it's ready. I don't know if this is good enough. I don't know if it's ready. What I would say is if you've revised something to to be the best that you can make it, that's a good time to show it to someone else. Whether that be an editor or just your buddy or um, your teacher or whoever, if you've done all that you can do, if you've taken it to the limit, that's a good time to share it, you know? So don't hold on to something forever. If you want to have an audience, if you don't want to have an audience and you're writing just for you, then ignore this. But if you want to find an audience eventually, don't hold on to what you have forever and just him and haw over it. If you can, find somebody you trust and show it to them. Because once you show your writing to one person, it gets easier to show your writing to many people. Yes, it is. Yeah. And then another thing I'll say about revision is just don't be afraid to revise. A lot of people think that if they're revising something, they're taking the magic out of it. But the chances are the longer you wait to revise it, the more you'll realize, well, there's some magic here, but there's also a lot of things that are not right. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Don't think, oh, you know, these people who are professional writers, they just sit down and it comes easily to them. Um, one of my favorite novelists, Matt Bell, um, he actually will write a whole draft of his novel. And then the second part of his revision process is to retype the entire thing. And that. it, that's a novel. Um, it's hundreds of thousands of words. And so he's not allowed to copy and paste anything from one document to the other. He has to go through every choice again and decide if he wants to make the same move. So every sentence he's got to retype in, and if it seems wrong to him, he'll revise it. And I think I would die if I had to do that. But I do revise each poem dozens of times. 
And what I'll say if you're new to that is don't do that. Don't drive yourself crazy. But work on it until you think it's the best it can be at that moment. You know? Yes, so. I like that. That's, that's I, my advice. I, I, I find my, when I retype my, I will go back through, because there are a few essays that I wrote in seminary, in grad school, that I'm thinking of, you know, trying to send somewhere or put on my blog. I take the physical copy and I retype the whole thing and you see things that you could not have seen the first or the second or the third time you wrote it but absolutely but um for those that are maybe interested in being published whether it be poetry <laughs> creative nonfiction, prose um what's the best way to go about that is it better to pick a few magazines or or areas that are of the type of writing that they write or just inundate <laughs> editors and yeah. magazines and all of that. Because it's, it's almost like, I mean, like throwing dart, a bunch of darts yeah. at, at the board, at least one's going to hit. Yeah. Well, you got to think of it as every time you submit, it's like you get a lottery ticket out of the machine and how many lottery tickets are going to hit. Well, I think we've all had those lottery tickets where you at least win a dollar. Yeah. Back. You know, and so um, if you can win a dollar back, you can probably, if you buy enough lottery tickets, send enough submissions, you'll probably hit, like you said. So I think at the beginning for me, I did kind of have the dartboard approach where I would just send to a bunch of places at once. And I think in some ways that's necessary because you find out where you are a fit and where you really aren't a fit. And a lot of it is trial and error anyway. Always the journals say, don't carpet bomb us. Don't just send the same thing you're sending everybody else. And I agree with that. I mean, you want to look at the guidelines. You want to look at what they're publishing. But another big problem I have, and I've had this with clients, is that they'll say, well, I've been thinking about sending to this magazine on and off for like six months or two years. And then I really think you're ruminating too much. Because since it is a lottery ticket, it's probably costing you zero dollars. It might be costing you two or three bucks. I wouldn't submit to a contest right at the beginning where it's going to cost you 15 or 20 bucks. But it's, it's probably going to be free. Um, and, and editors know. Editors see a lot of crap in the slush pile. So it's okay, you know, if you get a rejection. Getting that first rejection slip is huge. Getting 10 of them or 20 of them, that's the stuff that does make you feel like I am a real writer. Because you're at least doing it. You're doing the process, which is huge. You know, so I think it's okay to carpet bomb a little bit. Um, and then kind of another thing is to build those relationships with editors. So the first time you get a rejection slip that says, send again, you know, mention that in your cover letter the next time you send. And say, you know, thank you for, you know, reminding me to send again. I'm doing that now. You know, um, and like, okay, I'll tell you my one story about building an editor relationship right now. And we'll find out in a few years if this is going to work out the way I want. But Don Cher is the editor of Poetry Magazine. Don and I, over the last couple of years, now he's at least rejecting me personally. So he sends me these notes and he says, congratulations on your book coming out, but we're still not going to publish these poems. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, um, thank you for sending these. We enjoyed them, but we're still not taking any of them. But what I'll say is I've been sending to Poetry Magazine for probably five or six years, twice a year. Every six months I'm sending them something and it takes them five months to reject me. So that means as soon as that rejection is coming in, I'm sending out to them again. And I think one of these days, Don is going to see the light. We'll see. It may never happen. But building that relationship with that editor is crucial. Them seeing your growth is crucial. Sometimes on magazines, the editorial staff flips over a lot. They're a grad student run, and that doesn't really work as well. But um, I think it's still important to keep sending and knowing that it takes a while to get something published. I mean, there was a time there when I started really shooting for high level journals, I would say. And for seven months, I didn't get an acceptance. And I had, I was sending out five batches of poems a week. Um, and I didn't get acceptance for seven months. So there are those dry periods for everyone. Um, so keep that in mind too. 
it's hard, easier said than done again. But. So at this point, and what I'm excited about is I'd like to give you an opportunity yeah. to read a little bit of your work. I know you, <laughs> you said you planned on sharing some of your Cubs poetry, which I am ecstatic about, and then a few from your book. Conforms. Yeah. So if you want to read them in whatever order you want, yeah. go ahead. The stage is yours. Great. Oh, well, Lord. I will. <laughs> I appreciate that. I will read the Cubs poems first because I think that we've been talking about them and um, hopefully people will enjoy them. So uh, I'll read three of those. They're all really pretty short. Um, they should take under a minute to read and then we'll go on. We'll go on to the book. But so um, I have this one poem that I wrote very recently that I think is sort of a cornerstone for what the book will be. And um, it's called The Unsayable. So I'll read this one first and then we'll kind of go on from there. The Unsayable. If it never happened, would we go on buying the season tickets, scuffing the turnstiles, slowed at the bag check? If it never happened, would we split a pizza and a pop, a bag of chips or a beer, huddled as we handed over cash? If it never happened, would we still applaud the blue pennant tentative to ascend the flagpole after a series win. If it never happened, would we root on a 500 club, be pleased with less than 200 strikeouts, 20 errors at short? We flicker in our seats, dimly recede, but never leave. <laughs> That one's definitely a a um, a knife to the heart a little bit. So as a lot of these are, I found a lot of these poems. Big surprise about the Cubs are very bittersweet. So um, get ready for a little more of that. Oh joy! <laughs> this one's called Over Sheffield Avenue. So you know, as Jared knows, and now everybody else will know, Sheffield Avenue is over right field. So if you were going to hit a home run to right field and you hit it a really, really, really long way, now it would probably hit off the new scoreboard. But there's still a chance that you would hit it onto the street. And that street there would be at Sheffield Avenue. I'm playing baseball in the Garden of Eden. Scratch that. I'm writing baseball in the Garden of Eden, where old cars ride street corner curves in our square city while vendors hawk peanuts. I'm riding baseball out of the Garden of Eden. Clouds sail the blue-gold lake, a tincture Titian never mastered. Players skim the surface grass in pinstriped cottons. Blue hats, blue socks, blue numbers. I'm riding baseball out of the garden, I touch the field to liquefy it, a prism painted deftly on my eye. I'm writing baseball as it never was, from a Sunday on which we won it all. Another knife to the heart there. <laughs> I was going to read one that is also kind of like that, but I won't. I'll read something that's a little bit more. Um, I feel like sometimes being a Cubs fan is like reading a Hemingway novel. Yes, it is like that. And there's so much more. Um, whenever you scratch the surface, this is what I'm finding writing these um, poems, is that um, whenever you think you're covering the events that people care about, <laughs> you realize when you go to a reading or whatever that you're not, that there's more, you know, and that's how it is being a Cubs fan. It's the iceberg theory, you know, um, there's, there's always more. So I listened to this interview with Greg Maddox many years ago, and I've been saving up this idea for a poem for many years, um, where he talked about, um, and he was playing for the Braves at this point. So, um, this was years after his Cubs career, his first Cubs career, 
And um, he said he, he loved to listen to recordings of him pitching at Wrigley Field. So the radio broadcasts of him his games at Wrigley Field. As you said, the, the stadium was electric. And it was like no other place he had pitched. Um, and he loved to listen to these broadcasts of his early days and sort of visualize his pitching sequences. And for the life of me, I cannot find this article where he talked about this, but I wrote a poem about it and it's called Maddox listens to the game on tape. So hopefully this will appeal to some of your Atlanta fan base too. As one might expect more than anything, he listens, recalls the mound behind his eyes Neck tilted slightly and mouth ajar. He floats back to hear what caught the black for the scene between himself and the catcher. A shiver of light his arm shuffles through. When Uncle Mo spins the sigh of a career near done, he with Wrigley, the crowd a choir on the tape, catching spooling and writing itself again i can't wait for you to finish this book <laughs> i'm i'm trying to write as fast as i can and i am not fast because um no it's just it's interesting to to hear how other writers whether it's poetry novels mm -hmm. movies that love the cubs and love baseball how they capture the majesty and mm -hmm. of baseball and one of the short films I'm writing is, a, granted, the, the back story is a guy is trying to create a time machine to go back and stop Steve Bartman. But, <laughs> right. But the, the crux of it is a father teaching his son the love of baseball. And to me, baseball is the, and this is going to be a line in a time travel film that baseball in of itself is time travel because mm, so it's constant and the same and the maj the majesty is the same no matter what era and I think you're capturing that oh thank you I really appreciate that I really appreciate that I'm glad that the poems are working I want them to be sort of ghostly like you feel yeah. like it's all illuminating the the memories that you have <laughs> So I'm glad. But I'm glad. Confluence. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to read a couple poems from the book. Yes. Um, and I'll just read, I'll read something, total, some, a few things that are totally different. Um, I say they're totally different and you'll probably disagree um, because I think all of my poetry has some common thread. So I'll read this poem. This is the first one in the book. It's called Never Ending Birds. Soft bulbs of morpho blue, tight light pruned to a circuit, the swallows feather and vector the wind. I plume to watch, fresh in the ground, they ring the trees as their own sweet planets. Continuous streaks, the green blue preens take flying lessons. Beam to the ground, they are bound by, like no flown thing. They bring around the ground, and bright as floods in winter, flap the wind that takes them, pushes them into its envelope. The swallows, so close, beat. I let them scrim my stance, twist neatly, solar. I swallow, lift at my chest where the freckles crack, where the wet wings gleam, swallows sweep out to swing, my heart up with the hawk who circles the skirmish, weeps and screams. And as you can tell, that's one of my favorites to read because I now have it memorized. So well, <laughs> or I think to me, and this is this happened to me with a poem. You read the the poem I'm talking about you read a couple of weeks ago and I think when you write a poem that is deeply meaningful to you mm -hmm. the process the physical process of the writing is like etching it into your soul 
Yeah, and I think for me, part of my process is literally reading reading the poem out loud to myself many, many, many times and working over the language verbally. Um, and so I am, there is an etching process. It's definitely, it's definitely stuck in my brain somewhere. Um, so I would say when this book came out, that poem was probably already memorized. But then I went and read it a bunch of places and now I really have have it. Um, that's one of those things that, you know, if you were an Alzheimer's patient, you might, <laughs> you might remember, at least in my life, I, I probably will. So that's really cool. Um, that, that's meaningful to me. And I, I think memorizing poetry is really important and people who do it, um, amaze me. So, yes, I will read a couple more. Yes. <laughs> I will read a couple more. I um, oh, I had one in mind, but let's do this. Let's do a couple of love poems, um, more traditional love poems for like a person rather than a sport. Which I guess that's more traditional. But this one's called "Walk Through." I walk through our home in mind to make a cup of coffee, greeting leaves in the picture window. I seem slow to grind the beans. A crystal dish, the things I love, the rooms gleam white and clean. Our desk is neat between your bills, my calendar and pen, the floor plan gauzed beyond a screen. Be tidying when I come, dust me off another thing. I bring to you the late romances, the walls suffuse in cream. Our room, your face, the porcelain, light unbuttons the dream. I itch my eyes open to fix on minnows squirting downstream. And then I have a habit of whenever I read, I like to read the first and last poems of the book. So even though I'm only reading three poems, I guess I will read the last poem in the book, which is sort of, it's a sonnet. It's a very fractured sonnet. Um, I write a lot of sonnets. So this one's called One Secret. So not to miss the moment of you, I stay my gaze. Hit play on the slapdash shrieked recorder of now. The blue table slides from under your pupil and out toward mine. Motions in sign. The language reminds. We will know each other's bodies now. Know how they will change. Dusk flares the bones groan. So I rub your stomach until you sleep. I neat my breath to yours as if you were a child. The confluence of rhythms begins. It is only sound and meaning, sound and meaning. That's it. Thank you for reading those. Yes, no problem. I think what I really like about your work and what, and just great poetry as a whole is it's like re listening to a soothing, good symphony or, or music, it's, meditative music. It just envelops you and makes your soul feel warm and feel good. And whether that's hyperbolic or not, <laughs> it's, I like, it's, yeah. It does that for me, too. It does that for me, too. And I like poetry that sort of, you know, will... I like poetry, actually, that's, that tells a story, which sometimes I don't write poetry like that. But the poetry I like to read is like that, um, <laughs> which is sort of interesting. And then I like poetry that sort of surprises you. Um, or like Emily Dickinson says, takes the top of your head off, gives you goosebumps. Um, but I do want my poetry to be a sensory experience. So I really appreciate that you comparing it to music because that's something that I want to do. So I'm glad that it's sort of coming across for you. That means a lot. Sandy, I just want to thank you for joining 
Creative Corner and doing this episode for for me. Um, it was definitely a pleasure. Yes. A great pleasure for me. Sure. For those that um, liked what they heard from Confluence and all that, what, what are the best places to get a copy? Um, yeah, what's the best place for, the, for them to get a copy? Yeah, so um, it's on kind of, it's where you would expect it to be. So you can find Confluence. I don't know if you can see this. Let's see. Um, there's the title in case you're, you need that. So you can find the book at Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Definitely type in my name along with it. So Sandra Marchetti. Um, and then you can also find it at my publisher's website, which is probably the best place to buy it to support small presses. So if you Google, um, Sundress Publications and just go to their website, they have a store that's, um, they have this, a store that's attached to their website, and the prices are really competitive with Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So, um, and they're always running sales too. So, any of those places, or if you'd like to contact me, you can contact me. Um, my email is Sandra S A N D R A Poetry P O E T R Y at gmail dot com, and I'll send you out a signed copy. You can pay via PayPal. So. I will. I will definitely provide all the links in the in the in the video description to help people get there. Um, I also kind of want to plug a mutual friends work, which is another place where we can, people can find your writing. Um, Eastern Iowa um, review. Yes. And um, yes. if you are also a writer, you can, I will provide a link for that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can read it online or get a copy. You can see Sandra's um, creative nonfiction. Yeah, um, and they're and accepting they're, work again. Yes, I'm going to say that. For you. <laughs> if you are lo if you were um, looking to have something published, or you want to submit and just take that leap and yes. submit it, um, I will provide that information also. And this is a kind and caring editor, so yes. you can feel you can feel very um, welcome to submit to Chyla's um, Eastern Iowa review. She's great. And they actually have a focus this time on the lyric essay. So if you have um, something that you've written that you're not quite sure if it's poetry or if it's prose or if it's somewhere in between, it might be perfect for Eastern Iowa Review. So. Well, thank you again, Sandy, uh, for joining me. And My pleasure. I'll say this to everyone. If you like this video, make sure to press that like button. Share it with your friends on um, Twitter, on Facebook. Facebook, wherever you may want to share it, and make sure to press that little red subscribe button that's up there, or, and the little bell next to the subscribe button if you're on the mobile app, so you can get notifications when I upload more episodes of Creative Corner and my other series. I hopefully will get video gameplay up and more stuff up soon, but thank you all for watching. But yeah, that movie, I mean, you're right. It's, it's it's a terrible film, but it's so much fun to watch. I mean, Dolph Lundgren, Billy Barty, uh, Courtney Cox. I mean, it's it's a it's a really like stupid, you know, but fun film. And it's and it's harmless. Like, you know, I also hear a lot of stuff about like there just aren't good movies anymore, you know? Um I, I disagree with that. Um or that I don't want to watch bad films. It's like, why not? Like, what's the harm?